Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we would love to welcome another one of APSA's interactive sessions for the 2024-2025 academic year. Uh, we are pleased tonight to host tonight's session with Richard Peng, who is an AAMC representative, to answer general questions about the ERAS application process. I'd now like to have our wonderful panelist introduce himself, uh, Richard Peng. Uh, thank you so much, and um, thank you for having me to uh, having me join today. Let me go ahead and start sharing my screen here. Two seconds. Um, let's go ahead and do this one. Share. Let's switch it to presentation mode. Okay. All right then. Um, so thank you everybody for joining tonight and um, thank you to y'all at APSA um, to welcome me and invite me to tonight's uh, kind of Q&A panel session. Um, my name is Richard Pang, as has mentioned already before, I am on the ERAS team as um, one of the directors for account management. I've been at the AAMC for almost 10 years now. Uh, my background actually started uh, on the ground, um, working at the help desk, and then from there I actually transitioned over to the external relations side where I've gone on to help students and applicants. I've worked with program directors, coordinators, medical schools, and student affairs advisors, um, kind of prepare them for their season and uh, get things, that, again, that's just in, in terms of producing different resources and, and helpful materials, uh, I've worn many different hats across uh, the time I've been at the AAMC. So for tonight, my main goal really is to provide some background information for the first 15 minutes. Um, this is just the slide presentation portion of it. Once we get in the Q&A session, I might go back into the slides if there's particular questions that um, may be better answered visually. Um, and maybe at times, if people are interested, I can even pull up a demo account of my Iris, of the MyIRIS application. So again, uh, taking a look at the, uh, the agenda, uh, quick background, uh, I'll be sharing who we are, uh, the application process and what a season looks like, some uh, resources, and then of course the Q&A session. I'll try to keep an eye out on the chat and the um, Q&A, but let me go ahead and pause it for a moment. Um, I believe there are some announcements before we get started, is that correct? Yes, and thank you so much, Richard, for being here. We're, we're grateful that you took the time out of your day to come virtually uh, to our meeting and provide your wisdom and pearls to folks thinking about ERAS applications. Uh, my name is Erica Randazzo, and I'll be your moder moderator for the evening. I am a second year grad student uh, in the MD PhD program at Vanderbilt. Uh, the chat box also help, we'll, uh, we will have Mary Lorino and our volunteer live tweeting. Uh, the event will also be occurring. Uh, for those of you who are going to step away or miss a piece of this, uh, we will have it recorded and available to APSA, APSA members on our website. Um, as the moderator, I remind you to please submit your questions to the Q&A box. Uh, we've already received some that were in the uh, registration process, and we have a team of co-moderators behind the scenes who will be co collecting the questions live. Uh, you can submit those questions in the chat box. And those are all the announcements I have. Uh, so thank you all for being here, and I'm going to go ahead and um, have Richard uh, start his presentation. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Erica. So jumping right into the background of who we are, um, ERA stands for the Electronic Residency, Residency Application Service. Um, we're actually a part of the overarching organization. Sometimes when I'm talking to people on the road, they don't know this, but we're actually part of the Association of American Medical Colleges, um, which supports a lot of different kind of parts of the physician pipeline. And, and of course, um, you may have different parts, uh, it, different kinds of impact overall. But ultimately for ERIS, this is really a designed streamlined way for residency application process for applicants, uh, their medical schools, uh, letter authors and programs to kind of get through this um, part of their, their, their career. So again, in a nutshell, um, as applicants, you would apply using my ERIS. This is either for residency or fellowship. Um, ERIS in turn would take those application and supporting documents and send it to the programs. Um, at which point the programs uh, will receive those applications and there's many tools and features that they would use to review those respective materials. So it's pretty straightforward, um, but you can tell that there's a lot of different players that are involved in the space and services that are provided. 
On our end, these are kind of the four different services that you might see in terms of acronyms. Uh, My Eris, this is where you're going to be spending most of your time uh, as learners to complete your application, uh, select the different programs, uh, as upload and assign different documents, and ultimately apply to those programs. Um, for those of you who are um, going through the medical school route, you may have your designated dean's office uh, be there to support you, um, and they would be available to upload documents, generate a token for you to kind of start your application season, and of course support you throughout the season. Um, the third and fourth there is not going to be as prominent for you all. Um, the program director's workstation is on the flip side with the programs. Uh, directors and coordinators, reviewers and interviewers might utilize the system to uh, review your application materials and uh, move you through the, the application season. The Letters of Recommendation portal is specifically for your authors and their respective uploaders. Um, they would support you in uploading your respective documents that you request from them. And then of course, there's a lot of different players in this space, a lot of key stakeholders. And the gist of this slide is really just to say, if there's a specific question that you have um, about the overall application service, I know some of the uh, pre-registration questions was just you know, not having a lot of insight into the bird's eye view of the whole process. Just remember that if you have specific questions about accreditation, you might want to go to the accrediting bodies. If you want to ask any questions about the board examinations, USMLA scores, Commerce USA scores, you may want to go directly to the board examiners and BOME and BME. If you have questions about the match itself, that very last uh, piece of the puzzle, uh, you'll likely want to go to the NRMP for those types of questions. And then naturally, of course, Again, if you have any questions about the application itself, um, then of course, Iris would be the place to direct those questions. And so from a bird's eye view, this is the general process uh, of the application season. You start off the season with the designated Dean's office generating a token for you. Um, and then I'll go ahead and start breaking down the rest of this process with the next few slides. So for those of you who are um, participating in this current 2025 application season, these dates are going to be relevant and some of these of course have already passed. But for those of you who are anticipating the application season, you can generally expect this similar timeline. The season will begin in early June for you all, at which point you're, you're able to generate tokens from your Dean's offices and use it as a key to uh, start your application. Uh, at this point, you're filling your application, you're gathering your documents and upload they, uploading them. You're just essentially preparing uh, your general materials at this point. Uh, we typically at this time try to shoot out communications as you get those tokens and as you register. So the earlier you register your token, um, the better information you'll get in terms of communications from us. So pay attention to those at that point. In terms of the documents that you're preparing, these are the standard documents that you uh, would typically deliver in the ARIS application the personal statements, the letters of recommendation, uh, the MSPEs, or simply put, uh, almost alternatively, the dean's letter, the medical school transcripts. Um, if there are any IMGs in, in, in today's session, then of course the ECFMG status report. Uh, and lastly, of course, your photo and your respective board examination transcripts. Uh, and so all of these must be sent through the ERA system uh, for programs that are participating. Uh, and again, very straightforward, but just keep in mind that um, as you're going through the season, you want to make sure that these are properly uploaded and, of course, properly assigned to programs of your choice. Once you get your application prepared um, and your documents ready, the next kind of section is, of course, the actual openings themselves. And we've got two dates to keep in mind here. Typically, the first September, uh, excuse me, first Wednesday of September and then the fourth Wednesday of September. Uh, the first one is going to be the applicant opening. This is when you all as applicants are able to start applying to programs. Um, the programs don't see any of the application materials yet. All this is doing is just certifying, submitting your application and sending it to the uh, programs. Uh, and it basically just gets put on hold all the way up until September 25th which is the program opening, at which point the veil, uh, the current unveils and your aid, the programs are able to start reviewing applications at that point. Um, I think I saw a kind of, um, uh, sometimes you get questions about why or what's the value of applying earlier at this point. Um, the really, the main point of having this um, 
interim between applicants opening and the programs opening is just to reduce the amount of anxiety, that fear of the first come first serve uh, kind of sentimentality. And so again, just take your time to review your applications, um, set up your signals, set up your documents um, so that you can, again, get your application in time by September 25th. But really just keep in mind that this is definitely a starting line uh, for the most part. As you are applying to programs, you naturally are gonna be asking questions uh, in terms of you know, who are these programs? What are those kind of specialty guidance that's available? Are there any sort of um, guidance in terms of letters of recommendations, guidance in terms of interviews, guidance in terms of any sort of additional documents like standard letters that uh, the, these programs are expecting as a part of their application? And I would highly recommend taking a look at uh, the QR code, which is the ARIS directory. It lists all the participating specialties and the programs um, at the start of the season. We try to solicit guidance from those specialty leadership to say, hey, as a specialty, do you have unique guidance within those kind of areas um, as, as that may be helpful for applicants as they're applying? And in addition to that, programs also go through an entire registration process to indicate that they're accepting applications. And so some things that they might list in their in, 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 in my areas for you all um, might be their social media and website information, of course, their general background information, their document requirements, whether or not they're adhering to their specialties interview timelines. Uh, and additionally, there may be some other filters, like uh, you are able to filter, filter this year, just start this year, uh, filter by their visa sponsorship. Now, I mentioned earlier that there's uh, an element of signals. Um, what are program signals? Uh, it's a part of the application itself, um, an additional kind of tool, so to speak, for applicants. It offers applicants the opportunity to express interest in a residency program at the time of application. And it's intended to be used by programs as one of many data points uh, in their review in deciding whom to invite to interview. And so essentially just think of this as like a, a kind of um, a super like button in addition to applying to that program. And for each of those specialties uh, that you apply to, there's an allotted number or type of signal that um, you may have for each of those specialties. And so currently for the season, and this may change in the future, of course, there are 23 specialties participating in program signals. For each of these specialties, they may have their own model, they might have their own specific numbers, um, and they might have their own guidance. Um, you might see on the left-hand side, uh, I, we have general national ANC guidance to signal your home and away programs, uh, home and away institutions. Uh, this is mainly for equity reasons, but of course there might be um, unique guidance either at the specialty level uh, or maybe even the program themselves uh, might have guidance on their own too as well. So again, some tips, and, and I know we can talk about the research at, uh, maybe during the Q&A portion, but I do wanna talk about some facts and tips about signals, um, just operationally. Um, one is you do not have to send signals all at once. Um, remember there's that period between the applicant opening and the program opening. opening. You can take that time, bookmark and save the programs that you're interested in, assign your program signals accordingly. There's a whole tracker in the MyAero system that allows you to see um, how many you have left, where they've been allocated. Um, and so again, take that time to really make sure your signals are going to the right place. Um, you'll see the second bullet there that program signals are sent at the time of the application and cannot be removed or changed. So what you don't want to do is apply to the programs and then try to assign a signal after that. Oh, excuse me, that looks like the slide jumped a little bit too early there. Um, the other bullets there, as you can see, is just relevant to the NRP SOAP process. Signals, remember, are meant to be used prior to interviews and not meant to be sent during the uh, SOAP process itself. And again, uh, signals cannot be sent after applying to a program. Um, with regards to interview and matching with programs, uh, this is after you've applied. There's a significant portion of time here that you're interviewing with programs. Um, at this point, what I would definitely recommend is go back and review your documents. Um, make sure that they're all uploaded appropriately. Make sure that they're all assigned to the appropriate program so that when you apply to them, they are sent to the programs. Uh, what you don't want to do is have a situation where as you're interviewing with the programs, you find out from them that you're missing some sort of document in your portfolio. The other piece too is of course, um, keep in mind that 
programs may be using different kinds of interview tools. And so it's important to communicate or at least research how the programs are conducting interviews. Uh, last season, we actually announced our first year collaborating with a, a kind of um, existing interviewing tool and, and kind of uh, 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 called, yeah, an interviewing tool called Thalamus. Um, if you've had experience applying in the past or you talked with colleagues in this space, peers in this space and the, uh, have, who have gone through this before, you may have heard about this before. Um, but what, the one thing to expect is that there's been a, a generally very high rate of adoption for Thalamus in these past two years. I believe around 80% of programs, at least in registration, uh, excuse me, 84% of programs, at least for this season, have indicated that they will um, potentially use Thalamus as their interviewing tool. And so again, this allows them to do virtual, hybrid, or in-person interviews. It may vary from program to program. You're able to use your mobile app to track and get your scheduling, interview scheduling. Um, and of course, this is uh, all integrated with your Iris account or AMC account, so you don't have to jump between applications. Um, the other kind of piece to take into consideration here is, again, your, your uh, your designated dean's office, your student affairs, your advisors, um, they might have experience in these application seasons. They, they support students year after year after year. And one thing that can really help them in this endeavor is also just having more complete and comprehensive data. Uh, and so one thing that you'll want to do as you're going through MyEris is to actually release some of this information to them. There's kind of three points of release. One is your uh, program signaling information, uh, authorizing the release of that data. Another is the interview information, authorizing interview information. And then of course, last but not least, authorizing your application uh, information as well. Uh, the benefit of this, of course, is as a kind of more bird's eye view of things, uh, your dean or support staff at your medical school will be able to give you more accurate representations of what expectations should be like uh, during the course of the interview itself. So again, this is just kind of an overview of the key dates. Like I mentioned before, if you're participating in the ARIS application season in the future, generally this timeline is uh, fairly similar, uh, barring any sort of drastic uh, environmental changes. I think one year that we actually had differences in timeline was uh, the pandemic year, but since then it's definitely stabilized naturally. And one thing that we I do want to highlight is, of course, the pricing structure for the fees. Um, one kind of sentiment that we've heard in the past is just the burden of cost and applicants. Um, since then, what we've done is actually done a couple of years of research and, and listening for the feedback. And we've restructured it, A, to simplify the, the fee structure itself. It used to have multiple tiers to it. Uh, but secondly, of course, you'll see that the first 30 applications is significantly cheaper for applicants as they apply. And secondly, for those of you who uh, qualify for the fee assistance program, this has been extended into the area space. Um, again, this is only so far at least for applicants who already previously uh, qualified for the fee assistance program, uh, but we'll continue to listen to feedback and see how we can expand uh, these benefits and, and, and to, to assist applicants. And then last but not least, um, again, we have uh, a lot of resources online uh, that have uh, kind of indications of changes to the application, whether it's kind of changing fields on how they're collected, uh, reducing the or, or kind of setting the limits on the number of hometowns or experiences um, or even uh, potential changes to other sections of the application in the hobbies and interest area, as you can see here. Um, the kind of gist here is just to take a look at our resources online to see what those changes are, try to get into the application earlier rather than later so that you can anticipate these changes and adjust your experiences accordingly. And in terms of other resources uh, that are available at the AAMC, I do have a few plugs that I want to mention. Um, the one, the first one is, of course, the Resi Residency Explorer. We just wrapped up at the AAMC. Our research and development team just wrapped up two webinars. Uh, this week, actually. And as you can see here, the tool's goal is really to empower uh, students and applicants to explore and identify residency programs where they are a competitive candidate uh, and to find programs that fit their career interests and personal needs. Um, it's completely free. So all you need to do, all you really need is an AMC account, which you would need to uh, access a MyAris application in the first place. And the third bullet point is probably the biggest um, kind of uh, seeking point here, which is that A, it's comprehensive, and more importantly, it's an accurate source of data. These data are being collected from all these various kind of organizations. It's a collaborative effort, um, and uh, for the most part is 
uh, typically more reliable than what you might see uh, in kind of grassroots efforts online. And as I mentioned before, the idea here is to um, kind of help applicants uh, identify alignment and competitiveness so they can be better informed and make more competent, de competent de decisions. Furthermore, uh, we also, of course, have webinars. This is the first year that we did specialty spotlight webinar series. Um, I think there were some questions around the lines of how you might present yourself to program directors and programs as they review it in the best way possible. Um, and really, I would say the people who are uh, most fit to answer those questions are those people in that kind of space, those who are receiving the applications. These webinars have a, an advisor as well as a program director as the panelists. And they we try to kind of create a space where they can provide guidance, provide, provide insight um, into the review process and their application season as well. So definitely tune into these uh, uh, webinars. We're definitely intending to rerun them for the next seasons. Um, but again, there's already recordings online. Uh, those two links here, I can also share into the chat uh, later on, but those are great resources. And among those, again, like I mentioned, you can take a look at our user guides, uh, our worksheets. Those are all great uh, resources that you can utilize. Here's a QR code if you want to kind of get an idea of uh, Iris Insights, essentially just upcoming changes, upcoming tips. That's a great QR code. It's definitely um, audiences for more general audiences. You might see program content in there so you can get some insight as to what it looks like on the other side. And on the right-hand side there, for all the signaling and geographic preference questions, um, of course, data will really help drive your decisions there. Um, and we try to be as transparent and we try to release as much of the data as possible onto the Air Stats page so that um, our applicants, specialties, programs, advisors can easily access information um, and educate themselves on how they can approach the season. And then last but not least, um, we also have a, a, a support center at the AAMC. Um, they are available that you can reach for any sort of technical guidance, any sort of assistance with the application, uh, and of course, general questions about the process itself too, uh, if you're interested. And so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and actually turn it over to Q&A um, to start the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, that was very, very helpful. We do have some pre-submitted questions as well as questions that were inter entered into during the session. Um, so to start, is there a standardized way to apply specifically to PSTP programs, um, especially for pathology, or should uh, applicants email program directors before or after the application to indicate interest? Um. Yeah, so again, I'm not too familiar specifically with efficient scientist uh, route itself. Um, I what you what I can say is that when you go into my areas, you'll actually be able to sort and search the programs by many factors, including their specialty. Um, and so that's one way that you can, of course, narrow your focus down to just pathology type programs. The other plug that I wanted to make actually was the Residency Explorer. Um, again, it's a free tool that you can utilize. Um, and one nifty thing in the tool that I, I, I just learned today from the webinar is that it kind of has a um, program portfolio that you can compare your profile to. And basically it allows you to kind of um, view different offerings that the program might have indicated as part of their, their any sort of uh, previous surveys that they've done. So you can see if they have advanced kind of degree training, you can see if they have any sort of additional research rotations, you can see if they have any additional um, program offerings that may be uh, aligning with what you're looking for in a program. So that would probably be one of the best tools available between those two, the Resident Explorer, and of course, just searching the programs in MyIRIS itself and taking a look at the program listing information. Lastly, of course, you can actually take a look at their um, website information, which will be posted as, as a part of the program listing uh, as you're going through MyIRIS itself. Great, thank you very much. Uh, next question we have, in the 2024-2025 match process, is the algorithm used to match applicants with residency programs further specialized by the specialty? Uh, for instance, are there different algorithmic processes tailored to specific specialties or does the same algorithm apply universally across all specialties? 
that would go directly to um, my third slide in that there's many different stakeholders in this space. Um, the NRMP would definitely be the best positioned organization to ask this question from my understanding. And I believe you can go to their NRMP just general website. They have a nifty little, little video that explains their algorithm. Um, I don't think the algorithm specifically um, broken out by specialties. But again, like I would definitely defer to experts in the NRMP organization itself, or I would recommend you take a look at their um, homepage. And, and again, they have a great resource on there explaining their algorithm. Thank you. Uh, next question uh, that came up in the chat. What is the best way for us to see which programs require additional materials and what those materials are? The QR code just takes us to the residency program website. Do we have to do this individually for each program we apply to? Um, yeah, so again, when you go into my IRIS, one, one of the kind of registration questions that we have is just document requirements. Um, and so that's one way that you can go about it in terms of, again, as you go through my areas and you're looking at each of the programs, click on the informational icon for each of those programs to see what kind of requirements they have. That would be one of the best ways to go about it. Um, I would actually also just take a look at the specialty guidance too. They sometimes list if there's like a standardized evaluation letter that you have to associate with the letter recommendation. Um, there's kind of a template actually that's uh, was recently generated in this past season. It was a collaboration between AAMC and OPTA, which is the Organization of Program Directors Association. Um, and each of those templates actually breaks down the kind of requirements or expectations or what might entail as a, a, a complete application for, for those respective specialties among other guidance pieces. One caveat there, of course, is that even with those specialty guidance, um, to take it with a consideration that the programs may not necessarily adhere to those um, generally, it might vary from program to program, but for the most part, those are a good start in terms of uh, preparing. Great, thank you. Um, next question. Uh, what is the biggest mistake that applicants routinely, routinely make in regards to the ERAS? And what is the easiest to correct mistake that you often, that you most often see with applicants? Um, in, in my in my experience, at least uh, for the application, it's going to be a little bit through the lens of the application material itself. And one thing that I commonly hear is, again, um, not necessarily tracking the documents. It's easy to kind of lose sight of those uh, as you go through the season. It's very stressful and there's a lot of moving parts. Um, so one thing that you would want to do at after you've applied, just make sure you go back or even before you apply, make sure your documents are all uploaded and assigned. Um, make sure that they have been sent to the programs and there's a tracker in my areas for all the documents that you have. Um, another one is, as I mentioned before, uh, make sure that you assign the signals beforehand. Um, again, these are valuable currency as you're uh, applying to programs and, and indicating interest for interviews. Um, many of you may even know the importance of the interview conversion rates to, 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 the, to the match itself. And so, again, that's the first kind of step to getting to that end goal. Um, do you mind if I share this link just as an example in the chat? Um, so for example, for pediatrics, um, and I know there's a question about um, uh, the, the guidance in terms of where to find that kind of information. You want to click into the specialty itself, and it's at the top of each of the specialties, even when you're in my areas. But then again, there's a little template there that uh, kind of provides the guidance in terms of what ex are ex expected in terms of, you know, supplement information that's in, uh, required, any sort of standardized letters. This is just one example um, of that. And so, again, this would be a good place to kind of take a look at that um, to prepare for those respective specialties and, and what kind of requirements they have. Thank you. That was a great example. Uh, I think were very useful. Uh, next question is about the fee assistance program. For fee assistance program benefit, is that referring to the first 50 programs or uh, per specialty or just like 50 programs overall? I believe it's it's a flat 50 pro pro programs overall. Um, one thing is before you actually apply to the programs, there will be kind of like a calculator that just does all the math for you. So I would play around with that to, to kind of see how the discounts impact your application. Um, 
but yes, it would be just, a, it's not specialty specific as I understand it. Thank you. Uh, during the presentation, you discussed signaling. <clears throat> mm -hmm. If you preference a, a geographic region, what do other programs that you applied to that are not in that region see? Oh, okay. Sounds good. Um, I will go ahead and rely on slides a little bit. If you don't mind me kind of just level setting a little bit, not everybody may know what geographic preferences are. And so I just wanted to prepare this question uh, and uh, um, kind of information for this. Uh, so again, just to level set, geographic preferences is actually one part of the application that it got introduced maybe three years ago in the supplemental application. It was the first time that applicants could indicate any sort of preference for a particular geographic location or region. Um, we know from just past research that for both programs and applicants, um, kind of any sort of affinity to a geographic location or location of the program is, is highly, highly valued. Um, and so this is, again, just one way to build more transparency uh, and offer a different tool for applicants to communicate that preference. Right now, these are kind of the divisions uh, uh, that are available that an applicant can provide. Uh, applicants can select up to three different divisions uh, or U.S. Census divisions, and they're also able to provide a 300 character uh, kind of explanation as to why they selected those particular uh, divisions. And in terms of answering questions of how uh, it's shared with programs, um, it's it's fairly straightforward here. If you have indicated a division and an explanation, um, the programs will see that respective information. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, if the applicant indicates preference for another division, no information is displayed. So you're not the programs aren't going to see the other two divisions that you selected, uh, or they won't see your other choices essentially. So hopefully that answers your question. And then thirdly, uh, for applicants that in indicate no division preference, this means that you're willing to work anywhere in the US, um, they will see no preference as well as your explanation, which can really be as simple as I'm willing to move anywhere in the US for my residency training. And then last but not least, of course, uh, if an applicant chooses to skip the question, uh, no information will be displayed. Um, and so again, for those three options, definitely highly recommended that you choose at least one of those options to kind of either show that you don't have a preference um, or you have a preference for a division. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if you are able to answer this question, but for students who have done research, how do you include current but unpublished and not presented research projects on the application? That's a great question. Um, I'm not particularly familiar. Again, like this would be a question that you would, um, well, two things. One is I would take a look at uh, the tools and worksheets on the ARIS page if you don't have access to a MyARIS application. Um, go ahead and pull up this real quick. Um, but essentially, there's a publication section. I believe it does have a section for that. Um, one area that you can, again, use is the user guide or the worksheet to see where your publications might fit, just to kind of um, calibrate what the question was. It was specifically about any sort of research articles that weren't necessarily published fully. Is that correct? Is that accurate? Yes. Yeah, there's a section, there's an option for peer reviewed journals, articles, and abstracts other than published. Um, it's it's an its own entire its own entire section that you can input into the Myers application. Again, if you go to the resources and tools and worksheets page in Iris, you can see a worksheet. It's a representation of that application. For those of you who are applying in the future, just kind of keep an eye out around the February to April. Um, like the, that period, we'll try to push out those worksheets as soon as possible. Um, but we just it just depends on how dense of changes that we're making to the application itself. Um, one point that I will want to make for the publications, I know that that's a kind of obviously big part of y'all's um, portfolio in the application. Um, we've been hearing feedback uh, in terms of from the community at least the importance of kind of reworking that section of the Myers application in terms of how it captures uh, more modern publications and research. So again, that is something that we are keeping an eye on. We're do, we've been doing feedback sessions over the course of the past summer. We just haven't really come to a decision yet in terms of how we're going to be uh, making those changes. 
Um, rest assured, for those of you who are applying for this current 2025 application season, no changes have been made. If we do make any changes, we're going to try to give those um, updates as early in advance as possible. Again, typically it's maybe um, November or the early January period that we're able to kind of provide that kind of heads up, essentially. Um, the other piece too, just keep in mind that the experience section also allows you to input different types of experiences. And one of the kind of types is obviously research. Um, one thing that you may not be aware of is in the Myers application, you are limited to 10 experience types. And then on top of those 10, of those 10, you can select up to three most meaningful ones. Uh, and so if you believe that research is something that, of course, really in, embodies who you are and what you value the most, um, try to think about leading up to your application experience, at least try to think about how you can whittle down your experiences. I know you all obviously may have a kind of long portfolio, given your backgrounds in, in research and medical school, earning your PhDs. And so, again, like try to think about how you can really focus on quality of experiences rather than the quantity of experiences. Quality over quantity. I think that's a great point. Um, next question is about dual, uh, dual application, dual applying. So if you dual apply, but rank one specialty higher than the other, would you more likely match the higher ranked specialty? Again, that'd be a, um, a NRP question in terms of how their algorithm works and how that impacts it. Um, I believe, again, they have a really nifty video that explains, just simplifies the entire, entire thing in terms of your, your rank list is just based on your priority and, and it just matches depending on the program's priority as well as the applicant priority. Um, but again, I would def definitely direct those questions towards the NRMP as they'd be better decision to answer um, those algorithm type questions. Thank you. Um... Most programs are only listing that they need uh, three letters on ERAS or Residency Explorer or the website, but they don't specify what type of letters they should be. Where can this information be found? That's a great question. I would dive a little bit further into um, the program websites. You can potentially reach out to them. It really just depends on the programs themselves. Uh, I know for some specialties, one of those letters are supposed to be some sort of, you know, for internal medicine, it's SELs, for emergency medicine, it's SLEs, for um, other respective specialties, they have standard, standardized letters that they would like to associate with it. Um, naturally, of course, depending on your background as an MD or a DO, that might also change what kind of letters you're able to provide. Um, the most I can say here is that it does unfortunately vary and that you would want to take a look at the program's web pages to see if they have any sort of information. Or again, maybe they might have listed on their, um, uh, the, their program listing information on, on their document requirements page. Thank you. Uh, final question we have right now. Um, where can we find an explanation on resources for how to apply to both TY and prelim programs and advanced programs within ERAS? Will it be clear if a program is categorical and does not need a separate application to its prelim year? Uh, that's a great question. When you're in Myers itself and your research, uh, kind of scrolling through your programs, um, it, if you click on them, actually, you'll, you'll immediately see the tracks that are, are offered by the programs. Um, tracks are essentially the positions that are offered by them. And then, of course, they might even have an NRMP code that's associated with that track in particular, whether it's a prelim and advanced that you need to apply together or a categorical, categorical program that's available there. Um, it should be listed uh, as part of the program's track information in the Myers application itself. Thank you. And a final question, actually. Um, within the next four years, how do you see the ERAS application changing, if at all? Uh, that's a good question and also a very complex one. <laughs> um, I think that the, the application has changed already uh, quite a bit in the past three years. If you looked at the application, um, prior to the 2021 season, 2020 season, even um, it hadn't been changed in almost a decade, right? 
um, over a decade. And so one of the things that we recognized is that in this current environment where there's a lot more virtual interviews, um, the elephant in the room, of course, is the fact that there's a uh, high inflation of applications that programs have to sift through. Um, one of the kind of two main goals uh, have surfaced. One is to um, make the application a little bit easier for applicants to share, you know, who they are and what they value and showcase themselves to programs. And the other side, of course, is for programs to sift through all those applications to find those uh, applicants that also align with the, uh, their program mission, the program needs, and things of that nature. And so again, the changes that we've made in the past few years, and I don't see this changing in terms of goal and direction in the next um, four years, of course, is just our efforts to really bridge that gap between the applicants and the programs. Um, we know this is a very strenuous and kind of, and, and not kind of, very stressful um, process. And so one of the biggest things, of course, is uh, being more transparent, uh, building transparency in terms of what program expectations are, um, being more transparent in the data that's available, again, the Residency Explorer. Um, and again, all these application changes have been leading up to this point, whether it's the signal, whether it's the geographic preferences, um, whether it's kind of reducing the number of experience uh, experiences that can be input, it's really to narrow down the focus so that um, applicants are able to best showcase themselves and programs are able to best um, identify applicants that align with them. And of course, there's a little bit of both on both sides in terms of you know programs showcasing themselves well and of course applicants finding alignment for themselves too. So again, I, I would definitely highlight the the worksheet as a main play mainstay of of where where you can find uh, the most current changes to the application. And as mentioned before, if you are interested, um, definitely subscribe to the Iris Insights newsletter. Again, it, the audience is more general here, so you'll actually be able to probably glean uh, kind of the program perspective or even the advisor perspective. Um, as you follow these different newsletters on what they're paying attention to. Pretty much all of the changes that we make, it's feedback driven by the community. And so just think about that uh, in terms of what a program is, if you're asking the question of what a program is looking for, um, there's a lot of clues in the data and statistics. There's a lot of clues in, in the changes that we make into the application. Um, the other kind of, if, if you don't mind me kind of extending this into the signal section a little bit, um, I know there were a few questions with the, uh, actually, are we good on time or? Uh, we have about 10 more minutes. Okay. Uh, are there other questions? Is it okay if I talk about signals a little bit? There are a few more questions, okay. um, but you can go ahead and talk about signals. Okay. Um, I'll try to keep it quick here. Um, I mentioned earlier, of course, there's 23 specialties that are participating in signals. Um, one thing to keep in, in mind is that this is continuing to evolve. This is a, a collaborative tool that we, we work with specialties to innovate on. Um, and as you saw earlier, some specialties had really high numbers of signals. Some specialties had like five signals. Some specialties had a gold and silver signal, uh, basically a two-tiered model. One thing to keep in mind is, again, there's a lot of clues in terms of how programs are reviewing this inform these signals, and that's something to take into consideration when you look at the interview data. Um, but this is a, a quick summary of it. Uh, for a small number of signals, this is a good way for uh, programs to identify or applicants to show their top, true top programs. Um, it, again, doesn't necessarily establish a threshold that applicants uh, programs have for interviews. Um, but again, the cause there is that it tends to distribute the signals uh, a little bit unevenly uh, for the programs. And so just keep that in mind that that means that a lot of those signals have a lot of weight in this kind of uh, space. For those with large number of signals, this of course distribute the uh, signals a little bit more evenly. Um, and as I mentioned there, here in the cons, uh, th this means that these signals may have a very high impact in terms of converting the your application into an interview. So again, those are kind of two different philosophies on opposite ends of the spectrum. One is really to uh, see, hey, like what are the true interests uh, of, of the applicants in terms of programs that they selected? And the other one may be more as a way to see of like, okay, like of all the applications that have been applied, uh, who really does value my program in particular? Uh, and of course, one thing that I want to mention here is, again, it's continuing to evolve. We're already starting to see specialties kind of go in between the small and the large. 
Um, and so as you're reviewing the research and data for interview conversions, just keep in mind that it might not be a one size fit all. Like if you're participating in a future application season, it's important to keep an eye on this just to have a general idea of um, what expectations are going into season. Great, thank you. This is very, very useful. Uh, we do have a couple more questions that came up in the Q&A box. Um, First one, what is the time delay from when a letter of recommended le letter of recommendation is uploaded to ERAS and when the applicant is able to see that it has been completed? Um, it really depends. Um, if you are, uh, so, so typically the author would upload the letter of recommendation and as soon as they upload it, um, it would, it will automatically, you, you'll get a message in your message center almost immediately. It's almost like literally within a minute um, to indicate that the letter has been uploaded. That's the general rule of thumb for the uploading process for letters of recommendation specifically. Um, there are unique cases if you are an IMG, uh, which stands for International Medical Graduate, because your designated dean's office is a is the ECFMG, there is a little bit more of a processing time for letters of recommendation after it's been uploaded. And so that might be around three to five business days. Again, that's unique to IMGs. For most other applicants, it'll be pretty instantaneous. Uh, but again, better to do it earlier rather than later. Um, if you are intending to apply in the future, remember that you can, if you have access to your dean, uh, they can potentially generate tokens for you um, earlier than the actual season itself so that you can upload letter recommendations, just kind of hold on to it. Um, and then the only thing is there are steps that you have to do, but then what, what ends up happening is once you hit the application season that you're participating in, you can just import those letters that you've already uploaded in the past. What's really helpful there is, of course, um, that way, the authors maybe have you fresh in their mind when they upload it rather than coming back to them a year later or two years later and asking them to upload the letter for, on your behalf. And, you know, that might um, kind of devalue the letter itself. Great. Thank you. Uh, question again on signaling. Uh, does signaling need to be completed before the September, September 25th date? Um, it doesn't have to be before the September or program opening. Remember that that's the kind of start line in terms of when programs are able to start reviewing applications. Um, that's the general rule of thumb there in terms of uh, kind of viewing that. The idea is, let's say you have five signals allocated for a particular specialty. Um, you use the first four prior to that September 25th date. You still have one more left, right? It's based on... Um, when you apply to the program, it's not based on any sort of timeline. The only kind of condition to this or, or kind of uh, unique case is, uh, as you mentioned, as you see here on the fourth bullet, signals are not sent during the NRMP so process, so it's actually turned off during that process. But otherwise, you can send a signal technically throughout the season as long as you haven't used all your signals. That being said, um, programs and specialties, oops, this thing keeps jumping. Uh, programs and specialties may have different interview times or review times and some specialties that are highly competitive or uh, specialties that just have a lot of applications, they might be looking at applications on day one after it opens. And so that's another reason why we have that applicant opening and the program opening is so that you can take that time to do your final touches get it all, get your ducks in order and, and, and apply to your program so that come September 25th, you're not stressing about getting it in at the very last minute, like just have that stuff ready so that when the day opens, you don't have to worry about it. All your applications are in, your signals are in, your documents are in. Um, and at that point, you can at least divert your attention to uh, the interview process next. Thank you. Uh Next question, when a program says they require a standardized or structured letter of evaluation on ERAS, does this mean the MSPE? And if not, where can we find this information? Yeah, so um, the standardized letters are not MSPEs. The MSPEs are essentially your dean's letters. So your medical school would typically be the ones to draft this on your behalf, or maybe they might work with you and collaborate with you to, to um, create those evaluations and submit those on your behalf. 
The standardized letters are specialty specific. Um, typically, the, the kind of process there is of the four letters that you can assign uh, to a program, you can attach or maybe in place of one of those letter slot entries, um, submit a or have the letter author submit a standardized letter on your behalf. So um, what you can do is, again, for the particular specialties that require it, um, you can go to the specialty guidance page that I shared earlier um, uh, and, and find out if they have those documents. And you can even see the kinds of questions they have on there. They're typically some sort of PDF billable form. Uh, but again, it's different from the MSPE. Typically, it's either attached to a letter or in place of one of your LO, uh, letter entries. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to encourage, uh, like, <clears throat> like you have uh, applicants for the rest of some of the questions in the chat to explore the ERAS website and the resources um, you have lips listed. Uh, I want to thank you again for joining us on our webinar se session today. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I also want to thank the participants who made this ses session so very interactive um, and many other people, including um, the Physician Scientists Association, our board of directors, and all of our moderator moderators. Um, to all of our, um, everyone watching, our next interactive session is next week, Thursday the 29th. It will be from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, and it's called A Day in the Life of a Physician Scientist, so please stay tuned if you're interested in learning more. Uh, more information, again, can be found on our website, as well as the recording for this webinar. You can also stay tuned on social media and look out for further emails to register for upcoming events. So thank you everyone. Um, and we really appreciate all of your time. And thank you again, Richard. Thank you for having me and uh, best of luck to y'all in your journey to become physicians or already are. <laughs>